welcome to the Wednesday night Bible study. We're glad to have those here that can make it in the pouring down rain. Go three months of the summer with not a drop, and then we get it all in one day. And so pray for those that are out there on the roads and the flash flooding that they're calling for tonight. And so then winter comes on Monday. Amen. It's supposed to be a high of 50 and a low in the mid-30s. Now, some of us that are from the north, we like that. Some of you all folk can't handle that, but I'll pray for you. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're grateful for the rain, grateful for the opportunity to fill the lakes and the reservoirs back up. Just pray that you would be with those that are out tonight on the roads during this heavy rain and keep everyone safe. Thank you for those that took the time to come tonight during the storms and all. Just pray you'll bless them for being here. Give them safe travels home. We pray. For Sterling tonight, you'd continue to be with him during his chemo treatments and during this time that the, the chemo would take care of the problems and be able to uh, give him a chance at life. And Father, we just pray tonight for uh, Brother Tim's sister that you'd be with Amy uh, and help her with the situation she's going through. Just watch over and take care of her. Thank you uh, that her stepdad, Ben, is doing better and got a good report, answered the prayer. And just pray now that you'll meet with us tonight as we study your word. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, we are in Daniel chapter 4, a good good chapter, got a lot of good stuff in it. It's a unique chapter uh, because we're going to be looking at another dream, uh, but this time the dream is a little different. Uh, it's actually considered an official state Babylonian document. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is putting it down. It's to be spread throughout the land through all the people, important people, kind of an autobiographic or uh, of what he's been going through. Uh, and, and over the last several years, uh, the king is finally going to admit to pride, uh, that his, of his pride and his temporary insanity. I've had those moments, and we probably all have, have we not? And then ends up giving glory to God, the God of Israel, the God that is the real God. And God has a way of getting our attention, you know, and getting a hold of us. It's quite sad to see that the king had to go through all this before he finally submitted to God. But sometimes even those of us that are saved, we go through things before uh, God gets our attention, do we not? And wakes us up and we finally pay attention and do what we're supposed to. Job chapter 33, verse 14 through 17, it says, For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep faileth upon, uh, falleth upon men, and slumbering upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men, and sealeth their instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. And so God uh, will work on us to get rid of that pride if we don't want to get rid of it ourselves. And of course, one of the seven things that God hates is a proud heart. Yeah. And so Nebuchadnezzar obviously has gone through that. But God, as you know, throughout the Bible, used dreams and visions uh, Elihu went to tell Job that the dreams and visions do not get people's attention, that God sometimes allows disease to grip our body in order to get attention, and was trying to change the whole subject. Job, same chapter 33, verse 27 and 28 says, He looketh upon men, and if any say I have sinned, and perverted that which was right, and it profiteth me not, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. And so it's, it's about being obedient, and it's about repenting uh, when we do do wrong. And in Daniel chapter 4, uh, we have an example of God's amazing, matchless, perfect grace. And where would we be tonight without the grace of God? And so we're going to see that. Now, you remember the first time, in the first dream, God spoke to Daniel and gave him the image of the big metallic beast that stood up with the gold head and all the other uh, things that... Powerful preaching. All the other things that uh, it represented, the different nations and all that we've looked at. The second time was when he spoke to him in the fiery furnace. There was four walking around, and the fourth one was like the Son of God. And uh, he protected the three Hebrew children, and God will protect us. Now, we're going to see in this chapter the third time. Uh, but this time it's kind of a humiliating manner with which God is going to show this worldly ruler. Because this one's going to be about him. And so point number one, and we've got this broke down into three weeks so that we can get done. But point number one is the dream. We're going to look at chapter 4, verses 1 through 18. But number A is the king's introduction. 
the king's introduction. Verse number 1, chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Now you notice he's, of course, back then the old, all the earth was just right over there where they were at. It's not like it is today. Uh, peace be multiplied unto you. Does that sound like a wicked, evil king? <laughs> peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now, this is him talking about Almighty God. Uh, and so this is a, a document, a state document, kind of like a, a decree uh, that he has signed himself, and that he is sending out to everyone in the whole empire, all the people, all the subjects, all the captives, the towns, the villages. He wants everyone to have this, all the ambassadors. Now, why is that? Because he wanted the people to know that he had an encounter with the true God. <coughs> when you got saved, what did you want to do? You want to go tell everybody. You want to tell everybody that you met God and that you got saved and what God has done for you. And so uh, he had been a pagan most of his life. Uh, as we have seen, he had acknowledged the God of Daniel back in chapter 2 uh, when Daniel interpreted the dream and told him about the dream. And then uh, he acknowledged Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the same God, back in chapter 3 that we looked at a couple weeks ago. But this seems like a genuine work of grace, God's grace. Because without God's grace, we wouldn't have that. Uh, you and I today wouldn't be saved without God's grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. And so it's kind of God's grace. And I'm thankful for God's grace. But you think about it. He kind of sounds like uh, the Apostle Paul when he said, Peace be multiplied to you. Uh, what on earth does he know about peace? I mean, he spent his whole life conquering and to conquer kings and countries and what have you. What does he know about peace? But that's the thing when you get to know God. No God, K-N-O-W, no peace, K-N-O-W. No God, N-O, no peace, N-O. You've heard that saying before. He ruled with a rod of iron all his life. Uh, he lit, made that statue. He conquered lands. He conquered people. He put fear in people uh, throughout his reign. This man knew now that the high God was the only God, that the high God had come to him in a real way. And God has a way of getting our attention, does he not? Verse number four, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. Sounds like he's at peace. He's conquered everything he can conquer. There's no more to conquer. He's at home in his palace, flourishing, enjoying life. Everything is going good. Everything was all good and dandy. And so, uh, but you think about that for a moment. Uh, you think about what we've studied thus far. He was at rest and flourishing. And yet he was deceitful. It was a deceitful peace. It was a deceitful rest. Uh, it was kind of a, a false sense of security. And that's what we have without Christ. We don't have security. I was listening to a preacher today talking about uh, in the last days there will be false prophets and, and uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. There's a lot of those out there today. And, and what do they have? They have a false peace. They have a false God. They have a false uh, religion. And they're all around us. And we've got to be careful. Uh, because they're very deceitful, and, and they look good. Some think they're safe. Some say they're Christians. And remember what God says, depart from me. I never knew you. They did all these things in his name, but he said, I never knew you. So um, you have to have evidence to be at peace. Now, we can we can look at our lives and, and, and see what God has done in our lives, and we have peace. And you can tell because we have the Holy Spirit. And our spirit and the Holy Spirit... Uh, agree with one another, do they not? Mm -hmm. Look at verse number 5. I saw a dream which made me afraid. <laughs> First dream he had made him afraid too, didn't it? Mm -hmm. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. You ever had a dream like that? Mm -hmm. You ever had a nightmare? <laughs> and, and you're sitting there, and, and, and you, something's chasing you, and you're running and running and running, and you can't get away from it, and and sometimes I've done it and screamed, scared my wife half to death. And uh, But you can't get away. Then you wake up and it's almost like you don't remember it. But you're in a cold sweat and you're soaking wet and you don't know what's going on and it scares you. Uh, and then when you wake up, you're thinking, oh, I'm glad that was just a dream. And unfortunately, sometimes we fall back to sleep and it picks right up where it left yeah. off. And then sometimes we wake up, we can't even remember in the morning what it was. 
Honey, I had a bad dream last night. What was it? I don't know, but it was bad. And so we can't even remember. That's what Nebuchadnezzar is experiencing here, something similar to that. And he woke up, but unlike the first dream and this dream, he remembered it. All the mystifying details, all the things, and we'll see that in a minute. But they were still vivid and they were still real to him. And so maybe, maybe when he woke up, he was thinking back to that last dream, uh, uh, just 30, 40 years ago. I don't know, but he wants to know, well, what does this dream mean? And so you notice, secondly, the counselor's ignorance. Now, you remember those guys in the first dream. Uh, they, they couldn't tell him what the dream was, and they couldn't interpret the dream. Verse number 6. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might know, make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, and I told the dream before them. Now, remember last time he didn't tell them. This time he does, because last time he really couldn't remember. This time he remembers everything about it. I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. And so he tells them the dream. The dream is real. It's vivid. He understands it. But they still can't give him the answer. They're still fakes and phonies. They're still uh, like false prophets today. And so 1 Corinthians uh, 2.14 says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are not spiritually discerned. You and I can know those things because we have the Holy Spirit of God inside of us that helps us and interprets that. But this was the same old crowd, same old group of people that stood before him before, but they still didn't have an answer. But thank goodness, <laughs> Daniel was there. Now, he wasn't with this group because Daniel did, even though he was put in charge back in chapter 2, he don't associate with all that stuff. Remember, he kept his character, he kept true to God, and so he wasn't hanging out with this crowd. But these guys... They can't, they can't interpret the things of God because they don't know God. And so they're just as fearful and dumb now as they were the first time. But then you notice the prophet's insight. The prophet's insight. Verse 8. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians. Now that's the name that the king has given him, but that's not the name Daniel goes by because he's not the master of magicians. He don't, he, he don't get into all that stuff. Because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no secret troubleth thee. Tell me the vision of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. Now did you get that? Up here... In verse number seven, it said, or six, it says that he showed them the dream to the soothsayers and all those. Verse number nine, it says, tell me the vision of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation. Because he knew Daniel could do that. He'd already had that experience. And so he knew Daniel could take care of that because he knew Daniel's God would allow that to happen. And so Daniel is there and he's asking for this to be told. Now, Master of the magicians. He's held this position for 40 years when he got promoted back in chapter number 2. And, and he's only doing it because he was promoted and it's his call of duty that God has used him for. He's not hanging out doing magic and stuff with all those other guys uh, because it was against, uh, I mean, spiritual godly Daniel's not going to go along with heathen wizards and, and magicians and that wicked crowd. Same way with you and I. We ought not to be with hanging around that wicked crowd in the world. Now, we need to witness to them and give the gospel to them, but we don't need to be hanging around them, amen? And so Daniel probably kept distance from them, but kept an eye on things because he wasn't going to get involved in that forbidden uh, practice that they were doing. Uh, what a relief it must have been to the king to see his trusted advisor, the one that calls Daniel, but he changed it to Belteshazzar, to be able to come in and to know exactly what the dream was, and to be able to give the dream to him. Uh, and Daniel's been that way the whole time. God is using Daniel, and God has used the three Hebrew children, and, and God will use people in our lives, and God will use us in people's lives uh, to get his purpose and his plan across. And so uh, this document that he's putting together, he needs this information. 
And so that leads us to the last thing, and that's the dream illustrated. Verses uh, 10 through 18. Verse 10, 11, and 12 says, Thus were the visions of my head in my bed. I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and it was meat for all. The beast of the field had shadow under it, the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. Now, you know, that just sounds like a, a, so far so good, a nice dream. Big tree, beautiful fruit, takes care of everything. But Daniel knows that the tree is a symbol. It's a symbol of a world ruler such as Nebuchadnezzar. And so the king told how that he had seen this great dream and how that uh, it was so tall and so strong and so beautiful and clothed with leaves and loaded with fruit. The word all is talking about just a vast tree. If you can just picture someday the tree in your front yard will get to heaven. <laughs> we may not be here, but, yeah, exactly. but it, it's just... It's, it's the animals can take shelter and it's just this big tree. But you notice verse 13 through 16, the dream changes its tone and the wording changes. Look at verse number 13. I saw in the vision of my head upon my bed and behold a watcher and a holy one come down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, hew down the tree and cut off his branches. Notice the word his. Up here it was a tree with branches and leaves. Now it's personal. His branches. Shake off his leaves. Scatter his fruit. Lest the beast get away from uh, let the beast get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, let the stump of his roots in the earth, and even the band of iron and brass and the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast in the grass of the earth. Let the heart be changed from man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him and let seven times pass over or seven years. And so the dream changes. Now it's talking about a watcher coming down from heaven and the holy one. And uh, the watcher is an angelic representation uh, to represent heaven. God's angelic ministers, and we'll see later on in this book that Gabriel himself comes down in a later chapter, but it's a messenger. It's called a watcher. Uh, he said, hew down the tree. Now, the, the tree is representing Nebuchadnezzar, and hewing it down means that his empire is going to collapse. It's going to fall, and the, the watcher cried in the dream, tear it all down except leave the root. Leave the stump. Now, you know anything. Uh, we've got mesquite trees that we cut down. There's this much stump, just enough to kill your lawnmower blade, but it keeps growing back out. It keeps coming back. And so what he's telling him is that the focus has shifted, and now we're talking about the tree being a man, the tree being Nebuchadnezzar, and we're talking about some changes that are going to take place from being a man and having a man's heart to being a beast, and the heart would even change. And it's going to be for seven years. Verse 17. This matter is by the decree of the watcher, or the heavenly representative, and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basis of men. So what God's technically doing is saying, Nebuchadnezzar, you've done this, you've done that, you've been ruler, you've conquered, you've done this, but now it's time for you to understand, I run things. I'm the one that is in charge of things. I am the one that can take you down and stand you back up. I'm the one that you need to pay attention to. And so the watcher there, uh, the, the word most high or El Elon uh, is the word that's used, capital E-L, capital E-L-Y-O-N, and Elon, if you remember Melchizedek, the, the high priest Melchizedek that blessed Abraham, that was the same name used back in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18. 
And so it's a representative of God. Psalms 18, 13, the Lord thundered from heaven, the voice of Elion resounded. Psalms, uh, the psalmist cries out, El Elon, to be rescued in Psalm 57, 1 and 78, 35. So it's used 28 times in the Old Testament. 19 of those are in the Psalms, uh, meaning God. El, El means God. Elon meaning highest, so the most high God. And so uh, Nebuchadnezzar has heard the voice of the most high God. Uh, and that's his true name. And he is. He's the most high God even today. And you and I serve the most high God. And we worship the most high God. And so this uh, title conveys truth about God. He is the most high God. He's the most high tonight. The song, he's higher than the highest, mightier than the mightiest, I think it goes. Uh, so there's no other way to convey his power other than the fact that he is above all. He is almighty God, all powerful, all knowing. Uh, and so tonight, we serve that God. The word conveys God's omnipotence. He has the ability to absolutely do anything. He can take kings down and raise them up. He can take care of you and I. He can take us down. He can raise us up. We, we, think, we say, is there anything too difficult for God? The Bible says no. There's absolutely nothing. He is all-powerful. Uh, he is utterly and completely in control. Now, I know that guy in the White House thinks he is. And that other guy with the orange hair in the courthouse thinks he is. But they're not. Because even them, one day, their knees will bow. And they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so he is totally in control. Everything that's going on in the Middle East, everything that's going on in the world today, God's still in control. And uh, the Creator, He created all of it. It's His creation. He is sovereign. He is Lord over all things. He's Lord over you and I. And if He's not Lord over all, He's not Lord at all. And so tonight, we need to make Him Lord. He needs to be over all things. The one before whom every one of us, our knees will bow and our tongues will confess that He is Lord. One day we will do that. Uh, willingly, as in you and I, or unwillingly as a lost and dying world. They're all going to bow. And, and I start to tell people that. They need to know that. Those that think that uh, your God's this and your God's that. And so the king says to Daniel, okay, Daniel, let me have it. Tell me what it is. I know it's important. I know God's given me this dream. I know it has bearing on me and it has a bearing on my kingdom. And I know that you're the only one who can tell me the meaning of that dream. And he knows that because he's already done that one time. And so the power uh, of this universe is in the hands of Almighty God, the one who spoke it into existence. That leads us to verse 18. We'll close with that. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now, thou, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. And so he's kind of making a confession. He's kind of got his eyes open. He's kind of learning. And so here's the interpretation of the dream. Here's what it means. Come back next Wednesday night and we'll give it to you. Amen. And so, but this is the setup for it. Next week we'll start at verse 19 and we'll see the, the, the interpretation of the vision of the tree. And it's interesting and it's got some implications. So if you can, be here next week and we'll go over it and we'll see exactly what it means. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful and thankful for the visions of Daniel and the, uh, the fact that he was able to interpret these dreams and that you used him to show an evil, wicked king that you are Almighty God, that you are in control, that you are holy above all other, the highest of all. And we're thankful for that tonight. And we just pray that uh, you would show us and allow us to show the world that you are the most high God. And I pray that you'll give us traveling mercies now as we go home. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.